welcome to the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards April program. Uh, for tonight, we've got a program entitled Pollinator Gardening in the Piedmont. And uh, a few housekeeping items to start off with. If you haven't gotten your phones on mute, please place them on mute. And then if you have questions, you can raise your hands or put something in the chat and the uh, questions will be addressed before the end uh, of the meeting with our speaker. Um, I want to start off with who we are. We're the show um, in a slide two. I'm sorry. Um, we're the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards, and we're a local chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. We're one of the 19 local chapters across the state, uh, and our mission is to create, preserve, and protect wildlife through education, engagement, and enjoyment. Um, we have an all-volunteer leadership team made up of myself, Margaret Sexton, president, Arnie McLaney, who's the past president, Donald Bowles, who's uh, vice president, Eric Mick, treasurer, Caroline ben Brenniger, who's the secretary, with Amanda Cargyle, Donya Holly, Clyde Kaiser, Connie Harris, and Sandy Dixon, Dixon serving as board members at large. Next slide. Did you know that the city of Charlotte has over 1,385 certified wildlife habitats? With 100, I, th I think close to 130 now uh, being added in the last year. Uh, did you know that you only need five items on your property um, to certify your habitat, uh, to certify your property as a habitat by the uh, National Wildlife Federation? It's a lot easier than you think. You just have to have food, which can consist of native plants and trees, which provide food, which can supplement feeders if you have them. Uh, you need water because all living things need water and it can be supplied either naturally or by a stream or a pond or a lake or by a fountain or by a bird bath. You need to provide shelter, which native plants and trees can be supplemented with brush piles and houses. Um, you need a place to raise young, which again, native plants and trees can be supplemented with houses. And then you need to practice sustainable landscape practices, such as rain barrels or planting native plants, composting and eliminating invasive species, that type of thing. So it's a lot easier than most people think it is. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> You can become involved with the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards by doing a multitude of things. You can volunteer at some of our events. You can participate in our events or contest. Uh, you can join our chapter via the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Uh, you can assist with one of our chapter committees, such as communication, education, events, programs, finance, or marketing. You can get involved by serving on our leadership team. Uh, you can donate to our chapter, which is a 501c3 um, entity, or you can become a corporate sponsor, any and or all of those. Next slide. By joining um, Charlotte Wildlife Storage, you get to have, receive the monthly North Carolina Wildlife Newsletter, which is the Wildlife Wire. Uh, you also get to re receive the quarterly North Carolina Wildlife Federation Journal, which is Wild Lives, Wild Places. Um, you have access to some of our member-only events, which we have three to four annually. Uh, you get to network with other nature lovers. Um, and then you get bragging rights, uh, because most recently, some of we've won Chapter of the Year, Proud Partner of the Canopy, and hopefully, We've got a sustainable, uh, Charlotte Sustainability um, Award that we're up for that hopefully we're gonna win. So next slide. We wanna thank our current sponsors, which are Wild Birds Unlimited and Honey Bee Realty. Uh, without their financial support, we wouldn't be able to host some of the events and programs that we do. Um, so we really do thank these people for stepping up in our time of need especially since we've not been able to have a fundraiser in the, in the last year or so. Um, our next slide. We have some upcoming events. 
Um, we have, we're doing a group read, The Language of Butterflies. Um, we have um, our May program, uh, which is going to be May the 11th, I believe, is going to be uh, mosquito spraying and pesticides. Um, and it's going to be presented um, as a virtual meeting, just like a virtual program, just like this one is tonight. We also have uh, a silent auction going on starting this uh, Friday, I believe the 16th. Yeah, that's this Friday. Um, at, and we'll have, you'll be able to go to our Facebook and look at the items. We have 10 items ranging from a jigsaw puzzle up to a three night stay in Bryson City at a Airbnb. Um, and then we also have a Wild on the Water, Wild in the Woods a fundraiser that we're going to um, have in, on June 12th through the 20th. And basically, we're going to have some options where you can join a group, a small group of people for some of those. Or you can do it on your own but as and become a fundraiser. And we'll have some prizes for the person um, raising the most dollars. So stay tuned for more events. Again, check our Facebook page for that. And now, um, next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to our vice president, Donna Bowles, and she's going to introduce our speaker and program for the evening. Take it away, Donna. Oh, I had to unmute. Okay, well, I'm really happy to introduce to you um, Madison Omen so far. Um, I have known her online and one of these days we'll get to meet in person and that will be that will be amazing. Um, Madison is the conservation coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and she's also the lead person for NCWF's Butterfly Highway. And if if um, and I'm sure she'll talk to you about that today or tonight. And um, I really encourage you to participate in this program of creating a pollinator garden. Um, Madison graduated from North Carolina State University with a Bachelor in Horticultural Science. She minored in Environmental Science and Biological Conservation. Um, and after doing research, while she was a student, she, uh, she did research at Fort Bragg on an endangered butterfly. And from that, she decided she wanted to use her horticultural knowledge for conservation. So we're really happy to have her with NCWF in this role. Um, and she's been with the team since March of 20 and really has accomplished a lot. She does a weekly Butterfly Highway newsletter and it's just packed with information. And if you're not getting that, I encourage you to sign up for it. I'm sure she'll let you know how to do that. So Madison, we're just excited to have you talking to us about gardening and look forward to your presentation. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Donna and Charlotte Wildlife Stewards for having me. I love talking about plants, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and especially because I'm from the Piedmont, I'm right uh, from outside of Charlotte in Concord, North Carolina. So uh, this is just, just uh, going to be a fun talk. And just to give an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, I'm going to go over just briefly a few Piedmont characteristics. What are some challenges of gardening in the Piedmont? Uh, how can we incorporate garden design into our gardens? What are some plants that are native to the Piedmont area? Uh, gardening beyond plants and then a few garden examples and we'll end with a question and answer at the end. Um, and if you want, you can type them in the chat room during the presentation um, or you can raise your hand at the end and we'll call on you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Okay, so what are some Piedmont characteristics. Uh, we have uh, a hardiness zone of 8A to 7A, and you can see the shaded blue version here. This is the area of the Piedmont of North Carolina. And so what that hardiness zone means is that you want to plant plants uh, that can withstand average minimum temperatures down to zero degrees Fahrenheit and 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, those low minimum temperatures during the winter months can sometimes kill other plants, and so you want to make sure that you're planting the appropriate plants in the Piedmont area. Uh, and typically the clay soil that we have, that's going to be pretty much all across uh, the Piedmont. You're going to have that red clay, which can present some challenges. Uh, so the challenges, of course, are that red clay, and I'll go into a little bit more of why that can be a challenge. 
and then also our summer heat. Uh, so the big question in this hot, humid, very clay region is what plants are good for clay soils and summer heat? Uh, for the clay soils, the reason why it's sometimes an issue for gardening is because clay soils are made up of very tiny particles and those tiny particles are easily compacted, which will reduce the amount of air that is in the soil, which plants need. And it's also going to make uh, water and nutrients unavailable to plants. So adding compost to your soil, um, typically the best ratio is a 50% compost mixture with your native soil, which would most likely be clay. Um, this is going to make it more manageable to dig in. It's going to make water and nutrients more available to your plants and it's going to help your annuals and perennials get more established uh, quickly because they're not having to grow their roots into this very hard clay soil. Um, a lot of the plants that I'm gonna focus on today are na native plants, pretty much all the plants I'm gonna focus on are native plants. Uh, there's been a huge shift in uh, advocating for native plants, especially with um, these climate change and other characteristics that are making native plants a little bit more suitable for a garden landscape. Uh, and of course, the ones that are native to the Piedmont are going to be the ones that are best adaptable to our summer challenges and our clay soils. Uh, and so speaking of native plants, uh, we want to encourage you to plant more native plants and reduce the amount of turf grass that you have in your yard. Typically around um, 50 million acres of the United States actually consists of lawn, which is often a non-native plant. Uh, and it's very highly intensive. You have to water it very frequently, reseed every year, uh, fertilize it every year, and you have to cut it every, every week or every two weeks when it's during the growing season. So it's a very highly intensive plant to take care of, and it's not really adding much to our soil structure, both below ground or to our environment above ground. Uh, as you can see, the circled plant here on the very far left, this is our turf grass. It's got very stubby, root systems, it's not going to be providing a whole lot of structure, but in comparison to our native plants, these have a much deeper, much more fibrous root system that's going to improve our soil structure, that's going to improve water infiltration, and it's going to improve the ecosystem both below ground and above ground. Uh, so when I talk about native plants, I think a lot of people think, I don't wanna plant native plants because they're messy. And I think that that's not necessarily a characteristic of native plants, but rather just um, poor designing. And so I wanted to go over a few design characteristics or things that you can keep in mind when you are planting your pollinator garden so that if you don't want a messy garden, you can have a little bit more structure in your garden. Of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So if you want that more rewilding look, go for it. Um, but for some of us who want a more uh, put together garden, having these design characteristics in your mind can really help you accomplish that. Uh, so the first one, uh, the first concept I kind of want to put in your mind is this layered vegetation concept. This is what we see in the natural world, which is why so many of us enjoy going on hikes and walks and enjoying natural beauty. We see that there is a natural way that the world grows and that typically consists of an upper upper layer or the canopy layer and then a mid layer, which is your taller herbaceous plants and your shrubs and maybe your vines as well. And then we have ground covers, which are your shorter herbaceous plants and um, your spreading, crawling other plants. And so that's just one method of thinking about design. And then going deeper into design characteristics, there's five that I wanna go over and that includes line, form, texture, weight, and color. This one's line. This is how you look at a landscape and how is your eye moving across your landscape. Uh, th with this just very basic example, you can see that it's going up like this and then down. Uh, you have your eyes moving from left to right, and this can a lot of times help you plan your landscape because if you want something really focused on, you can direct uh, through the use of lines, you can direct your vision towards that focal point. The other one is form, and this can look both like uh, plant forms, uh, as we see in this image, we have this 
vertical plant form that has been created by these two very tall uh, cone shaped trees that create that vertical form. And then you have your horizontal form created by these short uh, ground plants that are just creating these nice mounds and that's creating this horizontal form. And um, so by having your form and knowing what that form is, especially in uh, in regards to your house, then you are able to plant a design that is going to be best for your garden. Uh, the other one I wanted to talk about was texture. This is one of my favorites to consider in a garden is and that's because we're not talking about the feeling texture. We're actually talking about visual texture. Uh, and so in this example, we have these spiky grasses, grasses that have these very thin linear leaves and placing those next to something else with a more broad leaf. Maybe it's a, a broad glossy leaf that has this nice contrasting texture against those grasses. Uh, so that's just one of my favorite things to consider when you're looking at a garden. Oops. The other one is weight. And so you can tell automatically by looking at this image that we have a large amount of weight shifted onto the left side. And this is mainly because this is a lot of plant material right here. Uh, we have these very large trees. We have all these ground covers and native vegetation. So there's a lot of weight right here on this side of the garden. And then on the right side, we have more negative space. We have more spaces between the plants. We have less plants. And this can be really important when looking at your house as well. Your house is going to have a lot of weight to it because it's going to be the biggest thing on your property most likely. And so by placing plants with a lot of weight either next to your house and then moving the eye down away, it can really try and balance out that weight. Um, even if you have Maybe you have a ugly shed that you don't really want people to look at. You can place more weight on the other side of your garden and move the eye line away from that shed that you don't want people to look at. And the other one is color. I tried to add color to this very non colorful graphic, so don't make fun of my scribbles. But um, this is just one way that I wanted to show how color can be very important in a garden landscape. So not only uh, do you see that this color is being repeated throughout the landscape, but it's also the same color. Not that you need to have the same color for uh, your garden, but a lot of times sticking to just a few different colors can be more beneficial than um, sticking to a lot of different colors that can often lead to being overwhelming. Uh, but having repetition in your garden of certain colors, uh, colors that really make you happy, uh, that can really improve your garden. OK, so before we get into all the native plants that are coming, I know you really want to look at those. I wanted to quickly go over uh, cultivars and native bars um, because you'll probably hear me talk about a cultivar a few different times. Um, and, and a cultivar is a plant variety that has been produced in cultivation by selective breeding. Uh, so this is a man made uh, type of selected plant. A native bar is just a cultivar of a native species. And I have this example here that I think is just perfect. Uh, so when you're looking at planting native plants, a lot of times people want to plant them to attract pollinators. And so this Echinacea purpurea or purple cone flower is one of our native plants um, that's beautiful and it's a big attractant for bees and butterflies. And the bees and butterflies are going to be landing on this cone shaped center that's full of pollen and nectar. Um, and so to the right here, we have the cultivar, which is uh, in those little quotations, the pink double delight. That is our cultivar name for this plant. And even though it is a native plant derivative, um, this is not going to be beneficial to pollinators because they have selected the plant to have more petals, which petals don't produce pollen or nectar. Um, so that cone shaped has now become more petals and has significantly reduced the amount of pollen and nectar that's available to your pollinators. So I just wanted to point out that example that even though it might be a derivative of a native plant, you want to still make sure that you're getting uh, the right goal from that plant. So if your goal is to attract pollinators, maybe you want to go with the straight species. Um, but if your goal is to have a lot more color, then maybe the pink double delight would be better fit. 
right, so let's talk about our native plants. So I've tried to put in a variety here and I wanted to start with a few ground covers. Um, this is green and gold, and this is a very popular ground cover. This is an evergreen perennial. It likes partial shade, but it can also tolerate some full sun if you are making sure to plant it where it doesn't get afternoon sun, it gets morning sun. Because again, that heat can be kind of tricky. Um, it can also tolerate full shade um, as long as there's some dappled bright light. It typically grows less than one foot. Um, but it's a great ground cover, especially if you plant it thickly, it'll eventually grow out and form this nice mat of um, blooming flowers. The, it blooms in the springtime and into the summer, but it is evergreen, so it's going to retain those leaves through the wintertime. So you're not just looking at bare soil, it'll have that green leaf texture through the winter. It is resistant to drought and floods, um, maybe not extreme droughts or floods, but minor droughts and floods, it will withstand those. And it's going to attract lots of pollinators with those bright yellow flowers that are just really, really attractive. Uh, the next one here is creeping phlox. And so this is a fantastic plant. I actually have this growing, I'm in an apartment, so I have a container, uh, garden on my balcony and I actually have this plant in it and it is gorgeous right now. It is in full bloom, um, but this is also an evergreen herbaceous perennial reaching about one foot tall. Um, it likes full sun to partial shade, so this is really good plant to put uh, in full sun, whereas the green and gold might be better for your partial shade or shade areas of the garden. Um, but this is a spring bloomer. It's blooming now. It typically blooms white, pink, purple or a combination of those. Mine in particular, the cultivar name is Pinwheel. So uh, that one is pink and white and it just looks like a, a pinwheel, um, like those things that you blow in the wind. So it does like moist soils, but it does tolerate drought. So this is making it a perfect plant to put into a rock garden. It's great in a container garden um, and other parts of your yard where there's maybe moist soil, but good drainage and sometimes a frequent, frequent dry period. But it's a great early nectar source. It's going to attract hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. And it's overall a very big statement plant, especially in the spring when you're wanting to add some spring color. Uh, the next one here is foam flower. This is a herbaceous perennial that reaches a height of one to two feet tall. So it's a little bit taller than our green and gold and our creeping phlox. Um, but this likes partial shade to full shade. So this is also a really good plant for those full shade where you maybe want to add a little bit more height and ground cover. Um, it blooms in the spring. So I think it's actually blooming now and will continue blooming into early summer. Um, but it will create a nice sizable colony over time, making it a really nice um, ground cover, especially with those nice broad leaves. The little spikes of flowers there, those are just so precious and beautiful, and they are going to attract your bees and butterflies. It is tolerant of deer and rabbits, not to say that they won't sometimes occasionally browse on it, but this plant is always going to bounce back from that, as long as the deer doesn't go too crazy. But this is good for woodland gardens, it's great for rain gardens, naturalized areas. And again, I've seen this planted in container pots, so it's also good for a nice container garden. The next one here is pink root. Um, this is a really nice flowering perennial reaching a height of one to three feet tall, so it's a little bit taller. Um, this one likes partial shade. I've also seen it planted in full shade as long as there's some, some dappled sunlight. Um, so this is a great, great plant to add to a shade garden, and you can see that it has these nice bright red and yellow tubular flowers. This is going to be a huge hummingbird attractant, huge attractant for butterflies, and it's going to just add a nice pop of color to your shade gardens, which a lot of times are typically green. Um, and so if you want to add a nice pop of red color in there, pink root is definitely a really good option. Okay, the next one here is cardinal flower. So this is also a herbaceous perennial. This one gets a little bit taller, two to four feet high. Um, it does like full sun to partial shade and it's got these beautiful showy red flowers. Um, you can see that our ruby-throated hummingbird, uh, which is pictured here, I think that's ruby-throated, um, is very attracted to these flowers. It's also going to attract other pollinators like bees and butterflies. 
It does need moist soil. I typically see this plant, I saw it last year several times planted along, um, just naturally growing along lakeside shorelines. Um, so it's really great along a lakeside shore, a retention pond. I've seen it planted in rain gardens. Sometimes it just finds a nice spot in your garden that's a little bit moist and it'll grow happily there too. Um, so this is a really nice plant. It'll bloom in late summer, so around July, August time frame. Um, and it is a really good plant to, to have to just have that really bright red color. Uh, Hoary Mountain Mint. So this is just a sample of our native mountain mints. There's, I think, two or three different kinds of mountain mint in our area, but this is just one that um, I was able to find. It, it's a herbaceous perennial. It reaches a height of three to six feet tall. Um, it likes full sun to partial shade, but there are other ones that do better in, in full sun as well. Um, but it blooms in the summer and it blooms in these little clusters you can see here. It's a flat top cluster with these little two um, lipped, two lipped petals that is going to be a huge attractant for different types of small bees and small butterflies. Um, the blooms are typically white and they might have purple or pink spots on them. So it's a very, very beautiful flower, but it is small. Um, so when you do plant it, you're typically wanting to plant it for that silver foliage. So it's got these really nice silvery gray leaves. And when it's planted in mass, um, it really can make a nice statement and a nice contrasting color to some of your other darker green plants that you may have in your garden. Um, so it is a, a great pollinator attractant. I see so many pollinators on this one. I actually have one growing in a container on my pot or on my back porch. It's in a pot. Uh, but this is commonly aggressive. It, it can take over a space, but the best way to control that is by division every few years. That just means that you have more plants to give away. You can share them with friends and family. Or if you want to control the spread a little bit more, you can try growing it in a pod like I do. It, it'll outgrow it, um, and then you can just share it with other others. So this is a really good pollinator plant. The other one we have here is Joe Pieweed. Um, this is a tall herbaceous perennial, so this is going to reach a height of five to seven feet tall, typically. It likes being planted in full sun to partial shade. It's going to bloom the best in full sun um, and it'll get higher when it's planted in full sun, given that it's um, planted in pretty moist soils. This is a great perennial that you can add to add height in a garden bed. Um, so when we were talking about that vertical, um, vertical horizontal lines, uh, that Joe Pie weed is going to be a great vertical line for that. And the reason why it's so great is you can see that it's blooming here on the very tops of your of the plant. So it makes a perfect uh, way to make this the center of a garden and then plant something right here in front of it. Uh, you can still see the flowers of the Joe Pie weed, but you can still plant something right here underneath it and you're not blocking it. This one blooms in late summer. Uh, so around July, um, maybe the end of June timeframe. Uh, but it's an incredible nectar source. I see so many pollinators swarming these flowers. I have seen probably five to seven swallowtails on a single patch of Joe Pie weed. So it's just a phenomenal pollinator plant. Um, in the fall, when the seeds ripen, that will attract some of our uh, songbirds like swamp sparrows. So if you want to leave those seed heads up for a few uh, like a little bit into the winter, um, you might be able to attract a few other songbirds as well. It's also the larval host plant for the pearl crescent butterfly, which is this butterfly right up here. So it's a really cute, uh, small orange type butterfly. Uh, so you just kind of get the best of both worlds as far as providing a larval host plant, but also providing that nectar and pollen. Okay, so this one is also the best of both worlds. It is going to be a larval host plant for uh, the most, probably most known butterfly around, which is the monarch butterfly. And it's also going to have these really nice circular orbs of flowers that are going to attract a bunch of bees and butterflies. Um, so this is a herbaceous perennial that reaches two to four feet tall. So it's not quite as tall as Joe Pieweed. 
but it does like to be planted in full sun. I tried to grow this in a container on my back porch, which is partial shade, and it did not like me. It was not happy, so I had to give that one away. Um, but this blooms in the summer and it forms these very interesting seed pods once it's pollinated. The seed pods are kind of like a crescent shaped, uh, crescent shaped pod that is, uh, when it splits open, it releases these silky, silky white seeds that are just um, going to be carried away in the wind. The seeds themselves are brown, but they have this like silky white uh, feathering uh, material that is easily caught by the wind and carried away. So it can spread and make these nice sizable colonies if it's given the room. This is obviously in a very big field where it has some room to spread, uh, but you can also just plant fewer colonies and, and control it that way. Um, but it is the larval host plant from the monarch butterfly, which is uh, our migrating butterfly that has been in recent decline. So I always try and plug in uh, the milkweed species so that we can help that butterfly out. But again, these nice pink purple orbs of flowers are going to be great for your bees and butterflies. Um, this can be added to a pollinator garden, a meadow garden, um, or other gardens that you might want to add it to. If you don't like the pinkish purple color or maybe you don't like the height of the other butterfly milkweed, um, you can also plant butterfly weed, which is a different species, but still in the milkweed family. Uh, this is a flowering perennial. It reaches one to three feet tall, so it's a little bit shorter than our common milkweed. And it also likes to be planted in full sun. So this is great for pollinators as well. You still have that nice cluster of flowers. Um, it's the host plant for three different butterflies, including the monarch. So you'll see some monarchs there. And it has this nice rich orange bloom color, which is just, um, it just makes the garden pop a little bit more. And you, I liked how it was incorporated here in this garden. Uh, you can see that this is mostly green right now in the mid late summer time. Uh, this is Baptisia, which is wild indigo, which is right here in the back. Uh, we also have some other green plants here, but this is done blooming. And these are other done blooming. I think I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so if everyone just wants to make sure that they're muted right now, that would be fantastic. Um, but anyway, we also have uh, this nice band of orange blooms that are right here in the center that really make that grass pop. Um, so really good contrasting there. I love how they incorporated that little pop of color into that overall green bed. It is deer resistant, so we have some milkweed that, uh, milkweed typically has like this sap inside of it that is toxic, uh, and so deer don't really want to eat it. So it's if you want a deer resistant plant, milkweed is typically the way to go, especially if you're going to be saving a, a threatened or declining monarch butterfly as well. But this can be incorporated into pollinator gardens, borders, meadows, you name it. It's it's an overall really great and versatile plant. And of course we have Black Eyed Susan. I feel like this is almost a staple in the garden, um, whether you like native plants or, or not. <laughs> it's just an overall really great plant. It's a herbaceous perennial, reaches a height of two to three feet tall. It likes full sun. It is drought tolerant as well. Um, in the fall, uh, when the seeds ripen, it'll attract goldfinches and other songbirds. This actually does really well in a container as well. Um, I've been growing it since last year, and I was able to witness a few songbirds picking off the seeds, uh, which was really fun to watch in the middle of winter. Uh, but it's also a great nectar source for bees, butterflies, and other insects. Um, this is going to be a pretty long, it's going to have a pretty long bloom time uh, in late summer uh, into early fall. So pretty long bloom time to add some floral resources for those pollinators. And it's the host plant for the border patch um, butterfly down here and the gorgon checker spot, or maybe I got those confused. Either way, these are the two butterflies that will use it as a host plant. Um, but it's great added to a meadow garden. It can be added to a pollinator garden. It's great to be used in borders. Um, I think that this would be a really great plant to plant in front of Joe Pye weed because you're going to have that Joe Pye weed just kind of towering over but still have this nice um, colorful plant right in front of it. So 
black eyed season, definitely a staple for the garden. Uh, next, we have wrinkle leaf goldenrod. So this is one of my favorites. I know that it can get a little out of control sometimes, but it is just such a beautiful plant. Um, it's a herbaceous perennial that reaches two to three feet tall. It likes full sun to partial shade, and it blooms in early, early fall. So even late summer sometimes, I think last year I was seeing it bloom in mid-August, I would say. Um, and so there's several different types of goldenrod. This one in particular is one of our earlier blooming ones, um, but it's going to attract butterflies and bees. The seeds will attract goldfinches, indigo bunting, sparrows, and other songbirds. Um, and it's a great to incorporate into a meadow garden or naturalized area, uh, maybe even into a pollinator garden or along the edges of, of, of a forest or something. Um, so this is a really great plant, very versatile. And one thing I really like about uh, wrinkle leaf goldenrod too is a lot of plants or a lot of insects will create these little galls in them. And at first you think, well, I don't want my plant to have galls, but if you are mm -hmm. trying to cater more towards wildlife, you might actually want to have that because in the winter time when food is scarce, a lot of birds will come and inspect goldenrod in order to break open those galls and take out that that insect. So it could be a really cool wildlife uh, incorporate into a wildlife food plot as well. OK, so to complement our early blooming, uh, early fall blooming goldenrod, we also have late purple aster, which is also a herbaceous perennial reaching two to three feet tall. But this one likes full sun to part shade and it is a late fall blooming plant. Uh, so I think that pairing any kind of aster with goldenrod is going to help create this nice long period of blooms, both for you to enjoy, but also for pollinators to enjoy as um, they prepare either to migrate in the case of the monarchs or prepare to hibernate through the winter months. Uh, so it is a late fall blooming plant, but it does need well draining soil. If it's in moist soil for too long, it could get root rot um, and not make it or not look as healthy. Um, but it blooms later than most other asters, uh, which goldenrod is, is an aster, so this is a good complement plant to that. It's going to provide nectar for bees and butterflies. Songs will eat the, uh, songbirds will eat the seeds. And it's also the host plant for the pearl crescent butterfly, which if you remember, that's the one that will also eat joe pie weed. So good pollinator plant too. And the asters really blew me away last year. I never really paid attention to them much until I started to learn more about them. And they are really a, sto a showstopper in the fall uh, when nothing else is really blooming. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, that's all of the flowering herbaceous perennials I have for you. Um, but I wanted to talk about little blue stem, mainly because this is one of my favorite plants to add for texture. Uh, so it's got that really nice fine blades of grass. Um, this is a perennial grass that's also known as a bunch grass, so it's not going to be spreading by stolons or rhizomes too much. It's going to stay nice and bunched like you see here and in here. Um, so it likes full sun. It is drought tolerant and it does need well drained soil. It does not like sitting in that moist soil. It could get root rot from that. Um, so this is a good plant to plant in borders like you have it seen here. This is a nice border of little blue stem. These are the blooms, these nice long stalks here. Um, they also have these really nice, uh, there's different cultivars, of course, um, with varying colors, um, but I particularly like the ones that are a little bit more blue, blue, silvery, blue color. Um, I think that they are very nicely added into a garden. Um, and these are also great for nesting material for birds and for native bees, actually. So the, the nesting material is one reason why you should plant it, but also it's the host plant for several species of skippers, which if you don't know what a skipper is, it's a nice, uh, tiny, very cute butterfly. Um, they typically have clubs and tinny, and they when they sit down, their wings are folded up, or they might spread them out kind of like a jet plane. Uh, so these skippers are wonderful pollinators, um, and this is the host plant that they will also use. So again, adding this to border, um, if you're having 
erosion issues on a slope, planting that there, um, meadow gardens, pollinator gardens, etc. Uh, switchgrass is another fantastic pollinator plant, um, and I call it a pollinator plant just because it is a very great host plant. It's actually pollinated by wind. Uh, but you can see that this is a, another bunch grass. It's got this nice uh, kind of columnar habit to it where it's just kind of upright. It's a nice perennial grass that reaches three to six feet tall. It likes full sun to partial shade um, and it blooms in the fall. So you can see that this is blooming right here. Um, these little fuzzy pink inflorescence uh, are, the, are the blooms actually. Uh, so it has this nice feathery look to it that's very soft um, and can add a lot of really nice texture to a garden. Uh, it does grow in clumps and it's used a lot of times for cover and for nesting. So just like the little blue stem, uh, a lot of pollinators may use or birds may use the, the grass blades for nesting material. It's going to attract birds and butterflies for that reason. Uh, host plant again for several different banded uh, skippers and for satyrs, which uh, a satyr is also another type of butterfly. Uh, we typically see satyrs in more wooded, wooded areas uh, or edge habitat. So this would be a great plant if you want to attract satyrs to your garden, planting it on the edges of woodlands. Um, it can be incorporated into a meadow garden, a winter garden, which I'll explain in a second, and other pollinator gardens. And the reason why I say it's good for a winter garden is because it's very good at keeping its structure through the winter. So even though this plant will go dormant, the blades of grass will eventually turn this nice tan color. Uh, the inflorescence here, the blooms will turn almost like a, a tan whitish color. Um, but those are going to persist through the winter, which can, if you leave it standing, um, it's going to add a lot of habitat, so you may have overwintering pollinators in there that you maybe want to leave, leave alone until early spring, but it's also going to create something more interesting to look at uh, throughout the winter. And you do want to cut it back in early spring before the new growth starts coming out, so cut it back in early spring, but if you want to leave it through the winter, I highly recommend it. I think it looks a lot more interesting than just um, Cut, cut stems all the way back down to the ground. All right, so switching over to some vines that I find very fun and interesting. Um, this is yellow jessamine, and this is a perennial vine that can be found all over the southeast of North America. Um, it reaches a height of 12 to 36 feet, which is kind of uh, misleading to some extent because it's very easily controlled on a trellis or fence line. Um, if it's out in the wild, it can sometimes get much taller if it's growing up a tree. Uh, but this is an evergreen vine, so it's going to retain those leaves through the winter. So you're not just looking at a bare trellis in the winter. It's going to have some, some sort of leaf still um, hanging onto the vine. But it does like full sun to part shade, and it is deer resistant. Um, I will say that it is toxic when eaten, so you don't want to put this around any curious children or curious pets or horses that maybe just want to munch on it. Um, so make sure you're planting it in the appropriate space, uh, but it is a great deer resistant plant that is going to grow very well on a trellis, on a fence, or other structure. It's going to attract pollinators. It's been blooming recently. I'm sure you've maybe seen this um, either in your own yard or in the wild, um, but I have seen, <coughs> excuse me, I've seen pollinators on it, such as bumblebees, tiger swallowtails, and all sorts of other bees. So it's a great attractant for pollinators, and it's going to add a very nice feature to your, your own garden. Um, I'm actually trying this out this year on my fence in the back, on my balcony, and uh, so far so good. It, it seems to not be, um, it's not quite an aggressive grower, I'll say, but it's more of a dense grower, which is really, really nice. And what, what you want when you want it to cover a trellis and fence, you want that really nice dense coverage. Another one of my favorites is passion flower. Um, this is a perennial vine. It reaches a height of six to eight feet tall. I uh, like spool sun to part shade. It's heat tolerant and clay tolerant, so perfect for the Piedmont. 
Um, and it does produce this nice edible fruit, which I've never tried before, but I know that it's often added in certain beverages and juices and other things like that. So if you have tried it, definitely let, let me know what it tastes like because I'm curious myself. Um, but it's going to be a great attractant for uh, bees and butterflies. And it's mainly because this flower, which which I can only describe as just a wicked looking looking flower, uh, it's oftentimes purple or pink or white. Um, and what you see here are these little stamens that just um, nicely arch down, which is the, leaving the perfect space for bumblebees. So I have seen bumblebees just swimming around in here, drinking up all this nectar and getting covered in pollen. And they're just so fun to watch. Um, this is a great plant to have um, to attract those bees and butterflies. It's also the host plant for the Gulf Fritillary, which is this orange butterfly up here and the red banded hair streak right here. Um, you can see that this person has had it growing up a, a pole, and so it's made this nice structure here that is just um, covered with, with different leaves, vines, and flowers. I grew this three years ago on my fence, and it also did really well. It did not make it through the winter because I think I, since it was in a pot and it rained so much, um, it did not like that moist, um, consistently moist soil, so it ended up not making it. But um, I do recommend passion flower for your full sun trellises and other garden structures. And if you don't have full sun conditions, there is a passion flower that is native, that is uh, better grown in full shade, which is Passiflora lutea or yellow passion flower. And the passion flower, uh, the yellow passion flower is significantly smaller, so it's just just tiny, tiny, um, but it's bright yellow or pale yellow, and it is really, really beautiful. Um, it's got these nice kind of lobed, uh, green, bright green leaves, and it's going to grow nicely on a trellis or other structures in your garden. Um, and we also have a native bee that will only eat the pollen from this um, particular vine. It specializes on eating that pollen. Uh, so if you want a passion flower vine, but you don't necessarily have full sun or part shade, you have just this uh, really nice uh, denser shade, then a Passiflora lutea might be a better option. Switching more to our trees here, I think I just have two more. Um, red bud, which is a small deciduous tree, you've probably seen it blooming. It's um, starting to leaf out now, so the blooms aren't quite at their peak. Um, it's a little bit past their peak time, uh, but this tree will reach a height of 20 to 30 feet tall, and it likes full sun to partial shade. Um, it has just, it's just covered in flowers in the springtime, so it's got these nice branches of full showy flowers, which are also edible. I've had them on salads before, which is just adds a nice little pop of color to your salad and it's very sweet and tasty. Um, so this is a really great plant for either a specimen tree just in your front yard or other parts of your yard, or it can be incorporated into a natural area where you maybe have a taller canopy and want some other um, shrub layer or mid layer trees underneath it. So it's going to be a huge attractant for your native bees and butterflies. Uh, when I saw this blooming just last week or so, it was swarming with all sorts of different kinds of bees. So it is a great plant for pollinators, especially in early spring when not much else is blooming. And it's also deer resistant. So uh, another really good plant for resisting deer. If, or if you have a lot of deer, then this might be a good option for you. Uh, and black cherry, this one is a showstopper for sure. If you have been on a walk recently, you may have seen this. Um, and so this is a deciduous tree that reaches 50 to 80 feet tall. So it's a bit of a taller plant, um, maybe more suited for your larger canopies. Um, it is a full sun to part shade plant, but it has this beautiful fall color that's um, just this nice bright yellow. And it produces these clusters of white flowers. And so on the terminal ends of the branches, you'll see these just arching, beautiful clusters of white flowers that are going to be a huge attractant for uh, different uh, butterflies and bees and other pollinators. 
And these uh, flowers, once they're pollinated, will turn into these dark red purple fruits. And that fruit is actually eaten by 33 different species of birds and mammals. Um, and not, not only is it a great food source for those wildlife, but it's also the host plant for, I think, 450 different insects. Um, so this is a really great all around wonderful pollinator plant, wonderful for wildlife. Um, it's the host plant for, you know, all those uh, hundreds of species, including the eastern tiger swallowtail, the cherry gall azure, and the viceroy. So overall, a very, very nice plant. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, you've done all you can to your garden in the Piedmont and you're still kind of fighting these uh, harsh conditions, um, these are just a few examples of how you can garden beyond pollinator plants. And the first one is you can just have bare soil if you want. Um, bare soil is needed for a lot of our ground nesting bees. So having bare soil or maybe just loose leaf mulch on top of bare soil can be a really great area for our ground nesting bees. Uh, you can also take any extra debris that you may have from your garden trimmings and placing them into a, a neat structure like this. This is um, a brush pile, but it's been contained between two uh, posts here to make this very interesting feature that's both beneficial for pollinators that can maybe overwinter in this and other wildlife species that can find cover. And then of course, adding bird baths or other structures to your garden can make it a lot more interesting, especially if you are having trouble growing a plant in a certain area, having a nice water feature or other type of structure can be a really good filler for that space. So here's just a few pollinator garden examples. I think both of these were taken uh, with NC Cooperative Extension. I know this one was taken by Debbie Roos. Uh, but this is just a really excellent uh, example of a pollinator garden. I especially love how it has Joe Pye weed in here. You can see it in action where it has this nice tall flowers up here on the top, surrounded by this river of echinacea or, or purple cone flowers. So very beautiful um, a way to tie in two different plants with very similar colors. We also have this metal structure in the middle that kind of also complements that pink pink color in both of those plants. And this is, can be really nice, especially for this heavily perennial garden. Uh, when a lot of these plants go dormant, you're gonna have this uh, metal structure remain there and add a little bit more interest in your garden in the winter time. Uh, and then over here, we have this nice um, bunch of goldenrod. So it's got these nice arching stems here that just look beautiful. It's this the brightest thing in the garden, this nice bright yellow. And then in the background, we have vines growing up a trellis, uh, which create a nice backdrop also for um, the pollinator garden in front. OK, so this is my, my last example that I find um, really powerful, and I hope it inspires you like it did for me. Um, but this is a typical home. Um, this was taken by a lady who I believe had a homeowners association and she wanted to redo her yard for uh, pollinators and to make it just more diverse, more interesting. Uh, and this is very typical. You have these uh, boxy bushes here in the front with turf grass. Um, nothing that's really sticking out or being very exciting for, for pollinators or um, just in general. Um, it's just a very typical uh, planting that it has your foundation plants and that's really it. Um, but she worked with her HOA. She was able to work within their guidelines of what plants she can use, which ones she can't. She did end up hiring a landscape designer to help her come up with this final design, but she was able to turn this overall um, very uninteresting garden landscape into a pollinator oasis. And so you've got this large diversity here. Um, and so a lot of people will say, you know, I have an HOA, so I'm not sure what I can do. Uh, but this is just a great example of how you can work with them to make something that's very diverse and very beautiful. You can see they have repetition in here. They have these repeating plants throughout. Uh, they have uh, 
these nice complementing colors of greens and pinks and whites. And you can see how they have garden structure where they have the taller stuff closer to the house. Um, you have this horizontal form here that is leading your eye from the smaller stuff in the front up to the house. So it's overall going to be a lot more inviting um, both for pollinators and for your own house guests. And so, of course, I have to plug the Butterfly Highway because this is um, my program, not mine, but NCWF's, and I work a lot with it. Uh, but this is the Butterfly Highway, and you can get involved. Um, so what it is is a statewide conservation restoration initiative that aims to restore native pollinator habitats. And it's free to take the pledge um, on our website, and you're basically pledging that you're gonna plant native plants and help um, protect pollinators or provide habitat for pollinators. And this can be anything from your backyard to your balcony. So my balcony, of course, is registered as a Butterfly Highway Pit Stop. Um, but it doesn't have to be that small or just a backyard. It could be maybe you have a, a very large field that you want to grow wildflower seeds for pollinators, you can register that field as well. Um, again, it's free to take the pledge, but you can also buy seed packets on our website that have a variety of different native plants that can uh, that are native all across the um, uh, Piedmont and also in the mountains and the coast. Uh, so it's a pretty safe seed packet to grow uh, wherever you are. And we also have butterfly highway signs which are great additions to a butterfly highway garden. So if you're ripping up all your turf grass and putting in these native plants um, and people are often going to be a little confused by that, uh, you can have this sign up that tells them exactly why you're doing it, why native plants are important and why pollinators are important as well. Um, and so it's just a nice, uh, really pretty uh, feature as well because of um, just this really nice design that I think is very beautiful. And then of course, if you want to learn more about native plants, you can sign up for our weekly butterfly highway newsletter, um, which you can do on our website. You can just go under the butterfly highway sign and then uh, there's, I believe, a section that says, how can you get more involved or how can you um, uh, stay informed? And you can just click that link there and it'll take you to the butterfly highway. Sign up for my newsletters. Okay, so if you're in the Piedmont right now, uh, obviously, there are several different counties across the Piedmont, so I just tried to put in a few of the ones that really stick out to me that we've um, bought from quite a few times. So uh, there's lots of different plant native plant nurseries that you can reach out to and look for plants. Um, lots of different seed companies as well, which is Roundstone Native Seed. Uh, you can also find a more comprehensive list on our website under, uh, I think it says, plant native seeds, and then there's a native plant resource list underneath that, and you are able to find native plants in your area that are listed out by county. So I hope that you find that helpful, because I know that a lot of times it can be pretty challenging to find native plants that aren't cultivars or um, just making sure that you're getting the right thing. And then, of course, you can always contact me. My email is madison at ncwf.org. Um, and you can visit our website for all of our different programs and other offerings. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can see all your faces and answer your questions. Ooh, I'm scrolling, y'all been chatty. Or I'm just scrolling through here to see what questions people have. Native night scented plants for bat for a bat garden. Um, so in North Carolina, we actually don't really have pollinating bats. That's more in the southwestern part of the United States or North America. Um, but there are lots of really cool night scented plants that could be. Um, Evening Primrose, I believe, is one. Um, Witch Hazel has, I know, blooms at night and will have um, some late flying pollinators. 
come to those. Uh, so that's just a few that I know of. If anybody else has any to add, feel free to put those in the, in the chat. Bats here typically will eat insects, um, so just planting native plants in general um, will help increase that native plant population. Also, having water near your property, um, bats a lot of times will uh, fly over water and, and other um, ponds and things for insects that are emerging there. So if you add water features, you might also be able to support the bat population. Um, the black cherry does not need a male or female in order to make fruit that I know of. I, I don't think that it does. I think it's just all on the same plant. Okay, so rain. Yes, we definitely get a lot of rain here in North Carolina. It's only going to get worse with climate change. Um, so what can you do for your rainy areas? Um, so there's a couple of different plants you can plant. Uh, of course, you might need to amend the soil if it's standing water. Sometimes that can be good for bog style plants like our native pitcher plants and Venus flytraps. Um, uh, the, the, the Venus flytraps might be a little bit picky, but some wet loving plants that I really like are definitely our sedges. Sedges are a really good host plant for satyrs and other pollinators. Um, there's also Clethra alnifolia or sweet pepper bush, um, which is one of my favorites. It can be grown actually in full sun and full shade. I've seen it growing in full shade on Fort Bragg and it still flowered just beautifully. So having a few other wet wet loving plants like um, sweet pepper bush, uh, what's the name of that one, Calicarpa, uh, beauty berry is another really good one, joe pie weed, of course, cardinal flowers. Those are just a few that I can think of off the top of my head. Are black cherry leaves toxic? Um, I'm not sure about that. I, I think they are. I think that the berries and the inner bark, the reason why I'm so knowledgeable about black cherry all of a sudden is because it's Tamara's featured plant in the newsletter. Um, but the leaves I think are toxic, but the berries can be used in jellies and the inner part of the bark has been used, I think, traditionally in medicines. Um, but I wouldn't try eating the roots and I wouldn't try eating the leaves. Are you available for a consult? Uh, you can email me. <laughs> I, I will uh, I will respond. Oh yeah, button bush is a great one for wet areas too. Thanks for, for that uh, suggestion. That's a really good one. Cherry laurel is toxic. Yeah, that's yeah, that one is. Uh, my presentation, it, it should be recorded, so that'll be sent out in the next um, few weeks. Uh, we typically try and send out the recording within the next two weeks, so that will be available soon. And what about the PowerPoint where we can see the pictures? Uh, the PowerPoint's not going to be sent out, but when we send out the recording, it's going to be on YouTube, so you'll have the ability to pause it. So if you want to take notes or anything, um, you can pause the video and write down some notes. Does that work? Uh, it, yes, it does, because there were some things, it went really fast, and thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, black cherry is good. If you want to learn more about black cherry, you can sign up for my newsletter so that you can read all about it and also a few nurseries of where to get it. Can I say one more thing about the wetland? I have some and I planted those corkscrew reeds. Mm -hmm. You know, corkscrew reeds grow really well in wet water and they're really cool uh, dynamic to a wet garden. Okay. Yeah, I'm not I'm not super familiar with that, but I know there's lots of different reed plants that are native that are just great for a wetland area. 
One of my favorites is um, white top sedge. Um, I've seen that one growing in uh, wet wet areas, sometimes with standing water, and that one's a really nice one too. These look like really tight curls going up in the air, so they're kind of spiky looking. So they are really cool and like, and they yeah. can wet. So for anybody. yes, yeah, okay. I think that's a type of juncus actually. It is. Um, it is. Saying, yes, it yeah. Is. Yeah, that juncus is a really good one to add. I th I see that one a lot of times planted in rain gardens. Uh, so that's that's definitely a good suggestion. Awesome. Does anyone else have any more questions? All right. Hi, Madison. I I just like uh, to to pipe yeah. in and say that um, Charlotte Wildlife Stewards does have a list of native plants on our website. And the Perfect. North Carolina Native Plant Society is also a good resource for native plants. Yeah, they're they're great. Perfect. Yeah, jewelweed is also a really good one for wet areas. That one's going to attract lots of bumblebees and hummingbirds and all sorts of things. Awesome. Yeah, I'll turn it over to um, Margaret or Donna if you guys want to say a few closing words at all. Madison, thank you. This is Margaret and I just want to thank you for what a great uh, program that you presented. Um, we will, as Charlotte Wildlife Stewards, will have uh, this, as Madison said, as a YouTube video on uh, with a link on our website. Um, on Facebook probably. So uh, don't forget to uh, join us for any other programs. We have one more program for this coming year. We've got some fundraisers coming up. We've got um, say just look at our Facebook, our web pages for all kinds of things. Like I said, we've got uh, we got a Kids in Nature Day coming up in October of next year, September or, or October of next year or this year. I'm sorry. I'm saying next season, but it's for 2021. So um, we're trying to uh, give you bigger and better and more things to get outdoors for. Anybody else have anything to say on the leadership team? I'd like to. I, I'd like to ask you if mooly grass is like like it has a lot of seeds and it will scatter around in a like a a garden in a like a development muley grass yeah muley grass yeah that that one's a um really beautiful plant i don't know much about it spreading too much um i haven't seen it really grown outside of where it's planted usually um and that might be because i i typically see it planted um in garden beds that have mowed grass so i don't know if it would be going into the grass at all and um, getting cut with the lawnmower but uh, pink muley grass is a native one it's i don't think it's a host plant for anything but it is really beautiful especially in the fall with those pink plants um, that's another good one for a rain garden i've seen that one planted in rain gardens also on i have slippery. one more it's the bunny tails the bunny tails mm -hmm. Bunny I'm not sure I know what a bunny tail. A bunny they're tail. called bunny tails and the seeds that I planted in my uh, other room are coming up prolifically. And they, uh, they're they not for wet gardens, but they're called bunny tails. It's a grass that has like a thing that looks like a little bunny tail at the end of the plant. Oh, plant. I see. Okay. What do you know about those? It, it, for you know just well, the texture just, yeah no it looks like it has some great texture i just googled it because i wasn't sure yeah. what it was but oh. it, yeah it looks like it's native to the mediterranean region um but it looks like it's also commonly planted in container gardens so i'm not sure about that one i don't really i'm not very familiar with it 
Um, uh, but if you are worried about it scattering, maybe keeping it in a pot that's maybe within a screen porch or something might might be a good idea. Okay, they're adorable. Yeah, they look really, really nice and fuzzy. Okay, well, Madison, thank you. This was a wonderful presentation. And as much as I research myself about plants and have been gardening, I always learn something new and get I know, ideas. I, I always hate to call <laughs> a, a, myself an expert because I'm just always learning something new. I just learned about bunny tails. So right. <laughs> I right. think that um, I, I just am really happy that you learned something new because I think a lot of times a lot of the pollinator plants are repeated in a lot of different presentations, but I hope that you got a lot of new things from it too. That, that reinforces it. And I just like to, um, you know, emphasize that this is prime planting season. And um, I know, uh, you know, the nurseries are chock full. I think if you're in Charlotte, Wing Haven is getting ready to have their plant sale and they do have a section of natives. Um, so be looking for that. Be looking for the those type of plant sales around. Okay. Well, thank and you. This is Margaret. Don't don't forget about Charlotte Wallaf Stewart's silent auction. I think we're going to have a couple native plants that you can bid on, um, and that's coming up starting this Saturday or this Friday evening. Um, so it's going to go for ten days, and like we said, we have ten items on there. Also, our uh, next meeting will be um, mosquito spraying and pesticides in May. And then we've got a group read um, going on as well. So there's plenty to stay active, plenty to do, and plenty to um, interface with us, yeah, even if we're doing it virtually. But good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone.